been since I walked over this bridge. I've been seeing on online, I've been seeing accounts of all the carnage. <laughs> like bikes plowing into bikes, or like bikes pl plowing into people. Wow, that pile of uh, whatever that is, those white wads of paper or whatever that is that's been there for probably since January. It is the end of June now. But you talk about the carnage up here. I mean, I've come within a breath of being plowed down or just mauled. And you've got these trucks. Look at this. I'm just going to stand in one place until this truck decides. See, he's like inching toward me, right? But there was, I remember one time in particular, I, um, Probably like 30 feet ahead of me when I saw a couple of bikes get tangled up. And uh, I don't remember if they both went flying, but one of them certainly did. The bike was like up in the air as I saw it hurtling toward me. And there wasn't enough time to move. All I could ask was, are you going to hit me or not? Like. <laughs> And it landed probably about 18 inches. And it didn't bounce or anything. And I don't know how common this is. The talk about it that I've encountered says that it's very common that the bicyclists involved just will not report something like that. Like, you're just not going to hear about it because they don't want to give their biking movement a bad reputation. The lane over on the other side was supposed to have been open I think over a year ago now. That was the, the lane over on the other side is supposed to be the pedestrian only lane. And I know that was a de Blasio thing, but still hasn't happened. I think that's been a year and a half now since they said it would open. And then there are these mysterious Wi-Fi antennae, which I'm not going to look for it now, but last time I looked for it, there didn't seem to be any signal coming from anything that looked like like these things. I mean, I'm sure they're there for a perfectly boring reason, but... So I've been having these discussions with myself about time the meaning of time, the nature of time. How much is left or how much, how much of it never even, never even happened. It's like human consciousness, you can't see it. I mean, you can represent it with a clock, obviously, but There's no particle of anything physical that you can point at and say, that's time. There, there it is. That's a second. That's a millisecond. Let's put that in a bottle and then make time immortal. But this job I have is, uh, I've started casting about for something else. I mean, I've been kind of doing that all along, but not real seriously. The job has changed my, my relationship with time. 
I don't feel drowning in it anymore. It's more like time is taking care of me. My job is not is not for the anti-work crowd. Not even close. I mean, for one thing, you have to show up. You have to be there. <laughs> All through the pandemic, I don't think there was ever a work remote option. And not only do you have to be there, but you're expected to be early. Definitely not for the anti-workers, right? I'm not making fun of it, by the way. I'm just pointing out that it's true. <laughs> I mean, I have a bit of an anti-work streak in me in the sense that I think offices and commutes and travel, it's, a lot of it's just a big waste of time, especially the travel. But I don't hate the commute. It is hard to think of it as anything more than a waste of time, though, at times. But the job, I mean, it's, when I say it's changed my, my understanding of it or my relationship, it's like my life had become pretty unmoored for about the five or six years leading up to me finally getting this job and unstructured and I didn't care and that's a pretty dangerous recipe I mean I don't mean to flatter myself but I don't think there's any flattery in it in saying this about oneself that I'm a pretty smart guy I'm an intelligent guy and one of the worst situations you, an intelligent person can find themselves is having nothing to do my mother made that comment about someone I knew in high school who was just ridiculously smart. Didn't even need to study the same. He was straight A everything. But on the first day that he could, I think it was his 16th birthday, he quit school and just sat in his bedroom. Always wondered what happened to that guy. But my mother would always mention him or often mention him in the spirit of like, whatever happened to that smart guy that had absolutely nothing to do. <laughs> but I find it, I, you know, I find it satisfying to be in a position where I have to fill little crevices of time, little nooks and crannies with activity and relevance. It's great to be in such a highly structured environment. It's a big part of why I signed up for the job, but there are other reasons, too. Okay, well, it looks like I survived. I'm only partly joking. This path is just a... a fatality waiting to happen with all the bikes and the people and the... the little trucks doing all of their little artistic expression. distance of this bridge is about a mile and a half, 7,200 feet, I think. I guess I'm in pretty good shape or something, because I can walk this and not even crack a sweat. It's a hot day. Or maybe that's not what it means at all. Maybe I'm a heart attack waiting to happen.
John who worked at, at that place, Sapphire. It's a strip club. But its uh, partner business is Primal Cut, the steakhouse. And she was always defensive about insisting, or preemptively insisting, that she worked in the steakhouse portion of the, the establishment and not the strip club. <laughs> hey, I don't care. But I guess people are going to judge. Even in these modern times. So here, I know I've done this before, but this is still relatively new. That they opened up this, um, this crosswalk. Before, you had to go all the way back down to First Avenue and go back around. All this was fenced up. Of course, you'd see bicyclists crawling that fence regularly, but you were supposed to walk back to First Avenue. So that little annoyance was finally remedied. Let's get some church bells here. Such a great sound. It sounds like they're coming off or coming from these buildings, but it's the echo.
indifferent to the church bells, but I think they're awesome. It's a great sound, and it's the only musical instrument still in use that has not changed its sound across however many centuries. So you're hearing now exactly the way Christ would have heard it. <laughs> or what you just heard, rather. It's like stepping back in time, and here I go back to thinking about time again. And it's true, I've been think about time and why do some of us get more of it than others? Why do some of us get any of it at all? <laughs> Listen to this. Mark Thomas discusses the mysteries of time. But all the abortion discussion in the last week has opened up a, a, a thing for a lot of people. A very sore sore wound it's going to make a lot of people's lives very difficult but that discussion in turn I mean it's such a deeply personal imposition that any, any jurisdiction can declare this to be illegal under all circumstances As I've learned in other contexts, men really deserve no place in this discussion. I mean, yeah, don't even let me go there. But with the matter of time, I ask myself why I got any. And the ruling last week reminds me that, of course, not that I ever forgot, that my mother had told me on a couple of occasions that she considered aborting me. she had her reasons apparently and it was still illegal in the 60s and I mean between that and my father being gay it's like my whole existence is just a existential quagmire but, but um, and I do often ask myself why did I get any time at all then I'm like, well, look, here's another day, here's another minute, here's another hour. I'm supposed to be in receipt of three copies of that New Yorker that I was in a few weeks ago. Well, that might be them. New Yorker magazines have become very thin. Yep. What else is in here? Those were the courtesy copies that I forgot to ask for ahead of time. So I went and blew, I think, nine bucks on one copy. Can't believe how expensive they've become. The Sunday New York Times was only six bucks. It's got, it's like five times the number of pages. I'll open this later, but this may be the last meaningful piece of mail I get at, uh, at the 181. I'll send him a note to thank him for this. Yeah. Yeah, they're like right across the street from where I work, basically. <laughs> when I say that she had her reasons, one of them was that she thought she might be too old. In those days, she was considered pretty old to be having another child. I also was unexpected, and that played a part because it looks like bad planning, doesn't it, when you give birth to a kid right as you're about to go move to Ghana, 
my dad was military and they knew they were going to get stationed somewhere in the world they just didn't know where and having an infant to bring along for that kind of thing really wasn't the best planning but that's how it happened I always did get a sense that she wished she'd done it but what can I say now And we also got a guy mumbling. Fuck off. Oh, oh. Please deposit twenty five cents. But she said thank you. The guy's really getting worked up. I thought I was all out of these cards, but I found a couple more. And I'm going to get out of here because this guy's making me nervous. Getting back to my mother and all that, um, another tweak to the discussion, or another twerk tweak, whatever's appropriate, was the last time she came to New York, which I believe was just uh, the summer before 9-11. I think she was here like June or July before September 11th. And that's the last time she ever came here. But uh, the conversation had this this aspect of her, a vibe of, well, so now that you're, you know, 40 or however old I was, there's a few things about the family that you ought to know. And she wanted me to know that her mother... self-aborted did the coat hanger in a motel bathroom somewhere in, in Nebraska or some Midwest state and my mother was there watching the whole thing and she seemed to be offering this up in a spirit of just full disclosure I, I stood to know or deserved to know that I could have had another uncle or another aunt. But she would always say that there was no no right on earth no reason on earth that the right to abort should be taken away. And the first time this, this was what informed moved the first time she told me that I almost didn't get born and I know she regretted saying that but she never took it back just realized as I came down here with all this whatever the hell's going on down here construction wise I don't even know if this one's going to be here anymore. Okay, it's there. It's behind that dude. I'm not going to point at it, but because he's standing right there. But that one should still work. These don't. I mean, I might as well try, right? 
Nope. Nothing doing. And this is one that I often leave out of the discussion just because it's not not exactly on my way to anything, but this is oh, what is this anyway? 34th Street Penn Station. This is the um, uptown C and E platform. Been dead a long time. But what I never knew about that night, what I never knew about the, uh, the coat hanger abortion night, because my mother didn't really give the story a lot of context, at least I don't remember it that way. I learned later from my mother's sister, <laughs> the one who was born, obviously. I learned later from her that uh, my mother and her mother, they were basically on the run. The di divorce had just been finalized and divorce was not spoken of in the 50s. And my mother's mother had no friends ever, ever in her life did she have a single friend. <laughs> and that's not a lie. So they had nowhere to go. Nobody to take them in or anything. So they just bounced from one motel to the next. And they'd leave before sunrise so they wouldn't pay the, pay the room rate. Yes, I was here earlier. That car hasn't been here more than a few minutes. But they were basically on the run because the divorce had just, just finished and they had nothing and nothing, no future really. But my mother never told me this part of the story was that they were in this filthy, disgusting motel with mice, you know, she would like spend the nights stomping on the mice coming up out of the holes in the wall. So as my mother told the story, it was like, she made it sound heroic and necessary, and I guess it was. <laughs> but it was interesting to learn later from her sister all the, the filthy details that she left out. She didn't ever want me knowing that she had spent the night in such squalor or something like that, I, I don't know. There's a lot about my mother I, I would never know. This is such a great space, sound-wise. Here you got one set of bricks that is cleaner than the others. like breakout a pattern from the breakout video game all right let's try this again i think i was last here two weeks ago now this is the top to me i was going to stand back and see if anybody picked it up while i was standing by watching but i don't think i'm gonna have time for that Please hold while we connect you to another New Yorker. I don't even have anything to say today. I'm kind of exhausted from everything else I've been talking about. I'm just talking to myself. Maybe I'll get into a really depressing conversation about abortion and the other answers.
sounded like somebody picked up, but you no know, such luck. Or, I mean, it sounded like it had stopped ringing, put it that way. Okay. That'll be my effort for today. Although, I'm going to step back and do what I said earlier. So I, I tried to find a place like across the street to camp out and stake this phone out to see if anybody approaches it, but it's a lost cause. shut off. I know it stopped ringing and nobody answered. And I heard some clicking sound come from inside the phone. I believe there's a lot of clicking noise right here. Let's try that again. Okay, I got the opening again. Oh, I get it. <laughs> I guess I missed it the first time. Somebody picks up just so she can say goodbye and hang up. That's beautiful. That was well worth the trip to come down here to Houston Street today. <laughs> and there was one other thing about time that I meant to add. And it's with respect to something else that was in the news last week. It was the one year anniversary of that condominium building in Florida that collapsed and killed a bunch of the people inside. I don't know if it's just because that happened down in Florida that it made such an impression on me. Uh, I grew up in Florida. I don't think that has anything to do with it though. It was just the, the way I read about it in the accounts. It was just these people were... That's the reality of being a, a live person, I suppose. But if you take a risk anytime you cross the street, but here these folks were like safe in their bed, or so they thought. Sleeping safe in their bed. And then the next in the next waking moment, they realized that they're crushed and trapped under hundreds of pounds of rubble or or whatever it was. And they're trapped and they spend the next four days starving to death because they can't get out and they can't do anything. And I would think there is a certain soul that could make peace with this reality. I don't know if I'd be one of them. I just got a confusing series of emails about these cards. I just ordered a batch last night. I thought I did. I was going to get 500 more. So I got an email confirming the order. Then I got an email canceling the order because they said they ran out of some component or whatever. I don't know what component means, but I'm talking about cards. But then after I got the email saying that it was canceled, I got the email saying that the order had been shipped. So I can't wait to see where this all goes. Maybe I'll get refunded the order and I'll get the cards. <laughs> anyway, this is Grand Central. Grand Central Terminal, as we accurately call it. I guess I'm going home now.